This is a Dark Magazine podcast. I'm Nalini Haynes, your host. Today, I'm interviewing a unique individual. She's a Chinese-Hungarian-American actor, a screenwriter, producer, crazy cat lady, Trekkie, and Halloween file, who graduated from the UCLA School of Theatre, Film and Television. According to IMDb, she's known for The Fair, The Midnight Man, and The Binding. Welcome, Brina Kelly. Thank you so much. And that's, that, that's a, I think that's a good summary of who I am. <laughs> uh, how about we start by discussing your new movie, The Fair, which I believe is a passion project. Absolutely. It is the definition of passion project because we... Um, we did not have anything else but passion on this film, and um, that really is is true. Uh, we, everyone who was on the, who who was on this film, my entire cast and crew, were there because they really believed in the project and believed in the script. And I owe them all a huge debt of gratitude. We <clears throat> shot the entire movie in six days. I mean, talk about passion project. It was the crew's hiatus week because they had the week off. They were uh, working on a TV show and various TV shows. And <clears throat> they're just friends of mine, colleagues over the years that um, that loved the script. And they got together and, and everybody got together and said, let's, let's shoot this. We have this one week window, we can make it happen. So we rented a studio and we rented a cab and, and we shot it for one week. And now, now it's the fair and I, I could not, be more proud of the final result and how it turned out was beyond my wildest imagination and I have my brilliant director and cinematographer to thank for that because I'm a writer everything I do like when I write something and I have a script it sounds like a radio play to me you know I can't really imagine it as a complete as a completed film because I, I, I lack that skill. So every time I see something that I've written turned into a movie, it's astounding to me. To just to, to just have words on a page and then and then to have it turned into a complete movie with, you know, with lighting and with music and with everyone else's hard work put into it is just that that truly moves me to see that all these people could come together and create something that started just in my head and turn it into a reality and turn it into something so beautiful is that's it, it's it's wonderful to see and that's probably the best um, the best experience of of them all for me it's the it's the most fulfilling part of being a filmmaker it must have been amazing to to be there at the premiere the other day yes that was just that was on tuesday it was two days ago and i, I think I'm, I'm still buzzing from it. i'm still recovering from it i don't think i've slept uh since that night <laughs> because it, it was because it was the first time a lot of the crew got to see it and it was the first time we were all together again since we were on set so it was very emotional and very um very lovely mm. to see the combination of our hard work and also knowing that it will be distributed so hopefully it will be seen by an audience and an, the audience the audience who uh would love it would find it camera shots include switching from black and white to color and strategic emphasis on objects that are later revealed to be deeply symbolic so did you plan this or was this someone else's arena um, yes, actually, the black and white and all of the and 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 everything was was written in the script. I, um, I as a writer, I'm I'm quite specific in my scripts, and all of that was was planned and and written out. And I specifically wanted to do the black and white for two reasons. First of all, it's because I'm a huge fan of The Twilight Zone. Uh, it's one of my favorite shows, and I've seen it way too many times to be healthy. I, I discovered it reruns when I was a kid and I've just loved it ever since. I think it's some of the best science fiction that was ever written because they had very limited resources at the time. They didn't have CG, they didn't have 
most of the toys that we have to play with today. But what they did have was storytelling and imagination. And they wrote some of the best twists I've ever seen to this day and some of the best science fiction stories out there. So if you haven't seen The Twilight Zone, it's really, despite it being made in the 1950s, it really holds up and it's really worth watching. So this is my love letter to The Twilight Zone. The lead actor, Gino, um, actually coined it better than I could. He said, our film is, uh, it's if The Twilight Zone had a Valentine's Day special. So. Yes. Yes. Absolutely. Yes. First and foremost, I wanted to pay homage to The Twilight Zone. So hence the black and white. And also beyond that, um, it, it really was for us because our film has to do with memory and discovery and and then being in in what essentially is a lull but then breaking out of it and seeing the world anew and seeing the world differently in your surroundings differently than what you had previously thought the black and white switch to color element actually worked beautifully for that so that there was a, a very distinct narrative reason for the black and white as well that that became such an important narrative part of the film so the black and white really worked out. And then as uh, and then when I saw the final product, I realized that uh, people look great in black and white. <laughs> I was I was amazed. I was like, wow, you don't you don't see any of the bumps or, you know, or lines or flaws or anything. Black and white is wonderful. And I wish we used it more because every time now I see the film and we, we pop the color, I, I almost um, almost get this sense in my head where I'm like, oh, let's go back to the black and white. That looked really good. <laughs> And, and plus, I have black and white cats. I have, she, she's completely white. There she is. And, uh, and I have an, another one who's completely black. So, they, I mean, maybe, maybe that, that was inspired something in there uh, subconsciously. <laughs> so, yes. <laughs> well, I personally thought that um, I love the black and white, but the color is also so vibrant and it's about engaging, like it, the You've used both modes um, symbolically, and I think it has a real impact as well as being gorgeous in both styles. I I agree, and I have to give um, a, a huge shout out to our cinematographer Josh Harrison, who is brilliant and just made magic in and 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 shot the the entire film in in six days. We could not have done it without him. And once we pop into color, he created such a warm, rich tone and and feel for the film that <clears throat> that uh, I think the audience actually don't feel isolated or too mm-hmm. alone or or too upset being out in that road because inside the cab is it, it's such a warm sort of inviting environment. And um, and I think that was very, very important to the uh, the quality of the film. And, and Josh did, and his crew did such a great job doing that. They, um, they lit, actually, and this is something that you won't see unless I point it out, they lit the world as though the moon were orange, actually. If you, if you go back and look at the film, with that yes. context, you can tell. Basically, that was sort of their um, their their mode of thinking. Josh wanted to uh, to create a very warm environment, even though we're in the desert at night. So basically, he he worked as though there was a giant blood moon mm-hmm. in the sky, and and that night, and the entire world is washed in that kind of warmth and in, in that kind of tone, and um, and it looked amazing and. Every time I see it, I am very impressed by by their work. Mm-hmm. Now, you've been working with at least some of the same people now for a few years. What, what are the team dynamics? How does working in a team over a period of time help the creative process? Oh, I think it helps it immensely. And it's one of the reasons why a lot of filmmakers do go back to um, to people they're familiar with. Uh, from the last film to the this one, I had... Same director, B.C. Hamilton, and same cinematographer, Josh Harrison. Um, and even, I can tell, even from the last film to this one, our our communication and our dynamic, and D.C.'s communication with Josh especially, has just been fine-tuned. 
and we're able to say more now with less and you know and 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 save more time having to explain things to each other and our communication has gotten sharper and better uh so i think it it definitely has has helped the more you know someone the more you trust them and also having done a film before i think gave the three of us um sort of the faith that we were going to be able to pull off an entire feature in six days i don't think we would have trusted each other enough um and or had enough faith in in our various abilities to Im basically embark upon such an endeavor had we not worked together before on a much bigger film with a much bigger budget it's like we know every you know we know our work and we know each other's work so reuniting on this film that history really helped us basically believe in ourselves and believe in each other to be able to pull it off that's fantastic the Fair is a character-driven movie that uses the Groundhog Day trope but surpasses it in its elegance, mystery and romance. It feels like you as, as a writer and, and as an actor, but you as a writer specifically, have come from nowhere. But I think you should be a best-selling author and movie maker. So how, where have you come from? Where have I come from? Well, that's a good question. Actually, um, I have been in the entertainment industry practically my entire life. I started as a child actor um, in China where I grew up. I was born and raised there. Um, my mother's Chinese, my father's Hungarian. And I was born and raised in China and I started acting since I was 11, uh, when I was 11 years old and basically television and, and stuff. So I'm actually very familiar with being on set and being in front of the camera and all of that. And then, um, I went to film school at UCLA and I graduated uh, from, and it was a great, great program and it was a great college. And after graduation, I started becoming a writer and I started writing for stand up comedians actually, because I, I basically, I come from a background in comedy. Um, and then from there on, I moved to, I, I wrote for a few years for this um, kind of, um, kind of variety show that was online. And I honed my skills there and learned to be a, a better writer in that time. And then for the last 10 years, actually, I have been a screenwriter, even though I have, this is my second feature film that I've gotten to put my name on, let's just say. Um, I've done a lot of rewriting and I've done a lot of, they call script doctoring around town. So I've been a writer for a while, but like I said, I've not a very social media savvy person. I don't have a huge online footprint because I just, I think I missed, I, I was just the cutoff, like the generation before. Um, I'm the people who are very, very good at that. So I'm, I'm trying to, to have more of a presence and to put myself out there more as, as a writer in my own right, you know, and, uh, and, and, and an actor and a producer and to put work out there. So this is um, hopefully the start of it. Um, it, it's very rare, if not impossible, for a writer without a love of science fiction and fantasy to write a movie in the genre that is as intelligent and beautiful as The Fair. Now, apart from The Twilight Zone, which you've already mentioned, what brought you to science fiction and fantasy? Oh, I, it's my favourite genre, actually. I, it's it's the genre that I love most, and ironically, this is the first screenplay that I've ever gotten to write within the genre. So to me, this is just, you know, a, a very much a dream come true. Um, I my introduction to science fiction was probably the Twilight Zone, but I was also of the generation that watched the X Files. So for me, I'm a huge fan of the X Files, and I remember coming home from school and watching it on reruns and then every Sunday night, not missing the new episode. That was a huge influence my, of mine as well. So all of the, the alien techno babble that you hear toward the beginning of the film um, on the radio, that's very much an, an influence there. And then that's the other thing, which is you, uh, I'm a huge Trekkie. And you mentioned that at the beginning. That's, that is one of the things that is part of my bio, is me trying to be cheeky. But uh, 
Star Trek is also a, a huge influence of mine. I, I grew up while Next Generation was um, airing, um, and I then went back and watched the original series, and I loved the original series. So I would say, outside of the Twilight Zone, I love probably those are my other two top favorite TV shows. And more recently, Black Mirror is just astonishing. And some of the most clever, innovative, socially relevant science fiction that I've seen in years. And, and that's one of the things I love about science fiction is that within the confines of the genre, you can really tell so many stories about so many things. There's a lot of humanity in it. There's a lot of, you know, social conscious uh, elements in it. There, it's, it's, it's strange because science fiction sounds a little cold to people who maybe aren't familiar with the genre and, and it maybe sounds a little alien, but the fact is it's, it's actually um, incredibly human and incredibly uh, deep. And uh, there are some amazing stories being told in the genre. And I, I would encourage everyone to, to check it out. Now, I was going to ask what, what influence, um, if any, Star Trek's representation of minorities had on your aspirations and career. And yet you said you grew up in China, so you didn't have that whole um, thing that so many people, well, did, did you have that thing that so many people talk about where they see a person of colour on Star Trek and it's like, I can do that? Well, I didn't have that moment myself, but I do know several people uh, who did. It's, it's strange because um, I never quite looked like most people uh, where I grew up anyway. I always look, I guess the uh, the way to describe it, the way that most people like, like my parents as friends or people who see me uh, would describe me would just be a little bit off, <laughs> you know, or just, just a little bit different. I, I grew up hearing that a lot because I do come from a place with um, essentially, uh, everyone are the same ethnicity. Um, it's, it's not nearly as diverse as uh, the Western world, especially the United States. So I did grow up very aware that I was somewhat different without being fully aware of it. But then I, as a teenager, I, I moved to the United States to go to school and I've been here ever since. So it was a little bit of a shock because having been an actor already and then coming here and realizing, especially at the time, this was the 90s, um, there was not that much representation for minorities, especially for mixed race people uh, on in American media and cinema and television. But then seeing that Star Trek had been so basically uh, so forward thinking in their casting so much uh before I, I i actually had kind of the opposite feeling that that most people did because at the time it was the 90s and i wasn't seeing a lot of diverse faces on tv but then i look back in the 60s and i saw some and i remember thinking huh this is um i i, I felt like like we had not made so much progress in the last 30 years but but then in the in the subsequent 20 we we have and we did and that's and that's that's a good thing and i am i'm glad to be in the industry now yes yep joss whedon's commentary the musical um includes a track titled nobody's asian in the movies alongside dialogue that reveals that marissa tankeroan co-wrote and originally starred in dr horrible the movie but she stepped aside for a white actor, despite the fact that Joss Whedon's following would have assured the movie's success, even in the face of racism. In contrast, your team kept you in the lead role. What factors played into this choice and how difficult is it to lead by example? For us, um that may have been the benefit of 
making a micro budget film. We, I literally could not have afforded to hire someone else to play that role. Uh, anyway, this is really, I mean, I produced it, I wrote it, I acted in it. I know I did catering on more than one of the days and I've driven transpo trucks for this film and the rest of us, we all did as well. So for, for me, it was, if this had been a studio film, I have very little doubt uh, and, and very little delusion that I would have been kept in the lead role. Let's just put it that way. But that's the benefit of indie film. Indie film is truly uh, an arena where you can be different and be unique and still have a voice. So I think that's the benefit of, of that. And I, I hope that the audience continues to support indie film so that more of us, a more diverse group of us can have a voice. I have personally no delusions about what it's like to be a, a minority and, 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 and be a, a woman as a screenwriter in this industry, especially in genre film, especially in genres like science fiction, like fantasy, like horror. Um, so it's, I know that I've signed up for a, a, a harder battle and, and, and a steeper hill to climb, but, and you know, that's, I, I will continue to, to fight as hard as I can to have a voice. And I hope that anybody who's listening to this or in that, you know, that more women and more minorities and more diverse people with stories to tell uh, could find their voices. And maybe one day when there are many voices and we can all be more heard. So as far as this film goes, it really is sort of the benefits, one of the few benefits of, of indie film, but, um, it, it's one of them, which is that this is this is an arena where we can still be more uh, where, where we don't have to worry about the sort of the studio or, or the production's bottom line as much. And we can make something that truly is a passion project. That is just a story we wish to tell and we wish to bring to an audience. That is awesome. <laughs> Thank you. Um, will you write a novelization of the fair? Oh goodness, uh, I have not thought of that. Uh, maybe a novella. It's it's. I don't know if that it would be very long. I I've actually never considered that. I've I'm a huge fan of novels. I'm actually a, a very avid reader. I read about three books every week. Um, but I've never quite considered writing one. So maybe if the audience, uh, if this film finds an audience and, and they love it, then I would love to um, embark upon something like that. Uh, yes, uh, maybe one day I would love to. Would you guest star on Star Trek Discovery if you had the opportunity? Oh, in a heartbeat. One of my, uh, one of my biggest uh, dreams in life is to play Vulcan. <laughs> I would, I would pay money for that. I can, I can, I can do this with both hands. <laughs> <laughs> so I, I was just going to say, I'm actually um, friends with one of the cast members of Star Trek Discovery, Doug Jones, who is one of the most wonderful human beings I've ever met. He actually played a very significant part in the last film that I wrote and produced called The Midnight Man. So I... Um, I feel very close to that show and I want to support it any way I can. And it's a wonderful show. And they've really, really found their stride. So again, I, I really hope that um, audiences support science fiction and, and, and go out and, and, and watch as much as you, you can. Yes, well, I hadn't heard about The Midnight Man until I was re researching you. That's another science fiction movie and it looks really interesting. Um, I would say... Actually, it's it's not. Maybe there there are several movies called The Midnight Man, but ours is as uh, it's an action comedy. Actually, it's 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 much more like. Um, have you ever seen the movie True Romance? Um, probably, but but I'm not sure. 
yes, it, it's an older movie. We've been compared to that uh, a, a lot. So, yes, The Midnight Man came out in 2016. Um, you can find it through my, my social medias or IMDb. Uh, please check it out. It is nothing like this film. It's in a completely different genre. But um, I thought the premise was that he was the central character was impervious to pain and then suddenly he's not and then he's experiencing. Yes, that is exactly. Yes, that is exactly that film. But um, oh, I was just meant that's there's actually there's there's no science fiction element to it. The the um, the uh, the condition is a real life condition that people actually suffer from and the medication that takes it away is an experimental medication, but it actually also exists. So that was me very much drawing from, it, it's it's strange because people come up to me about The Midnight Man and, and, and say, you know, cause it's, a, it's quite a fantastical story. It's about, you know, it's it's an action comedy and a, and a thriller, but I, I always explain to them actually the, the what seems like the sci-fi elements of, of that film were very much based upon fact. I did a lot of research into this, um, into this affliction and into the, uh, the, the science and the medicine behind it. So that's actually all completely true. So the Midnight Man is, is very grounded in reality, uh, very much unlike the fair. <laughs> and it's a comedy romance to, to just, or an action comedy. It's an action comedy with, I mean, it's, it's still very romantic because I, I think I am a romantic soul. And um, so I always, I, um, I, I would love to, I, I always fit a good amount of romance and uh, into, into uh, my stories because I feel like one of the most human things is our need for a connection. So to me, you know, the word romance and like the big bubble letters kind of have a, a connotation to it. Um, but to me, romance is almost a misnomer. What is romance except just human connection? And that's to me is, is, is much more, um, it is much more heartfelt and, and real. So I guess instead of saying, I always throw put romance in, into my films. I would like to say, I always put elements a real human connection in, into my films and they often manifest as, as romantic. Which mentally takes me back to your characters in the fair and they're having these inane conversations and <laughs> I fell in love with both of those characters. Oh, thank you. <gasps> um, oh. <laughs> anyway. They that, that makes me so happy because that, that was very, very much Gino and I, we, our goal was, our, our, our only goal in performing uh, those characters uh, while we were on set was to make them warm and, and inviting for the audience. We wanted the audience to connect to them, to connect to their situation and also to connect to them as people and then to root for them and to want to see the two of them together and to want to see things work out for them and that was that was our only goal so so to, so to hear you you say that was is is wonderful and um and and it's the reason why we made the movie is so that it could find an audience who will love it because we love it so much <laughs> I love it and I've been talking to my husband about it ever since I watched it and I'm trying really, really hard not to spoil it for him. <laughs> I hope he watches it too. I hope you watch it with him. Um, so what do you have planned for the future? Well, I am, well, I'm a, a writer so I have several scripts. Uh, two that um, I would really love to be able to make and, and, and make into films and make, you know, see come to life. Uh, one is actually a, a horror comedy, which is one of my favorite genres, kind of like Shaun of the Dead. Shaun of the Dead is one of my favorite films. Actually. Oh, I love Shaun of the Dead. <laughs> Shaun of the Dead is, is one of my favorite films. And I do come from a comedy background, so I sort of can't help myself. This is my dream project is uh, my own spin on a, a story like Shaun of the Dead. 
um, with, you know, heart and humanity, but also a lot of humor and a lot of witticisms, but also with genuinely scary premises and in horror elements. So I, it is my hope to, to one day be able to bring that to, um, to the screen, to all of, to all of you. Um, and whether or not I get to do that has a lot to do with uh, how how much people like the fair and how much people seek it out and how much people want to see more from me. So I guess I guess if if the audience wants to see more from he, from me, I'm always here and I'm always writing. <laughs> mm, absolutely. Uh, a final question. Who would win in a fight, Michael Burnham from Star Trek Discovery or Darth Vader from Star Wars? Oh, my goodness. You know, I, I want to say Star Trek, but um, I think Darth Vader might have the edge in that fight because um, the Force, the Force is a very, very powerful, very fantastical weapon. It is not like anything in the more realistically based Star Trek world. So... Yeah, the, I mean, he, he can literally use the force and pull a spaceship, you know, out of the air. So I'm going to have to give it to, regrettably going to have to give it to Darth Vader. Uh, but that, that is a great question. And, um, and I very much appreciate it. I, I love, this is what my internal monologue is like all the time, is I, I go around asking myself these questions, you know. <laughs> So, so yes, Darth Vader, regrettably, but I'm going to have to give it, give it to him. <laughs> Thank you. And it sounds like you're going to be the perfect guest for all the pop culture conventions. So thank you. So. Thank you very much for talking to Dark Matter. Thank you so much for having me. And, um, I, I, I appreciate it. Uh, and from the bottom of my heart and from the entire cast and crew, Thank you for watching the film and supporting indie film and letting us have a voice.